when we think of the Buddha's compassion, the first teaching that comes to mind is often the Brahma Viharas, in which he teaches us to be compassionate, developing goodwill for all beings, compassion for all who are suffering, empathetic joy for all who are happy. and equanimity so that these other three don't cause us to suffer. But the first thing he wanted to talk about, what for him was the most important part of his teaching, was discernment. He provided us with admirable friendship so that we would be inspired to adopt what he felt was the most important factor, most important internal factor, which was appropriate attention, applying discernment to the present moment. You think about his first sermon. He starts out with the important takeaway. He starts out with right view, learning how to see things in terms of suffering, its cause, its cessation, and the path to its cessation, and realizing their duties are appropriate to each. In other words, he's giving you guidance. As he said elsewhere, that a teaching that doesn't give you guidance as to what should and shouldn't be done leaves you bewildered and unprotected. So the Four Noble Truths, which are the categories of appropriate attention, those are the Buddha's protection. Those are your guide to Make sure that wherever you go, whatever you do, you're not bewildered. You have a sense of what you should do. Because the mind, after all, is an active faculty. It doesn't just sit here passively receiving things. Raw material comes in and you shape it. And as long as the mind is going to be active, that's its primary need, is knowing how to shape things properly. The Buddha can't change what raw material we've generated from the past, but he can teach us how to reshape things. That's what keeps us from being bewildered. That's what's our protection. Which is why appropriate attention, as opposed to bare attention, is the essential factor as you go through life. There are times when you simply try to Notice what's happening, but there are other times when you realize you've got to shape things. You're not stuck simply with whatever is coming up. I was talking with someone today who was complaining that both he and his wife had been attending a lot of Buddhist retreats. They've started using Buddhist teachings in their arguments with each other. A few nights ago, after they'd had a pact not to argue after 10 p.m. Here it was midnight and they were arguing. He asked her, can't we put this off to some other time? And she said, look, this is what's happening right now. You've got to accept what's happening right now. That's not what the Buddha would teach. Some things you accept and other things you change. And one of the things you've got to accept is the fact that you can change things. And so you always want to look to it, the Buddha's teachings for guidance. That's his compassion for you, is the guidance he gives as to what to do and what not to do. When suffering comes, you try to comprehend it. What does it mean to comprehend suffering? Try to take it apart in terms of those five aggregates, the five clinging aggregates. What are you holding on to in terms of the form? Whatever forms there may be in your experience right now, what are you holding on in terms of feelings and perceptions, fabrications, consciousness? Why do you hold on? What's the allure? When you see the allure, then you want to see the drawbacks of holding on like that. That's how you develop, develop dis dispassion and disenchantment, and that's what it means to comprehend these things. You see them so thoroughly that they lose their appeal. It's like 
playing tic-tac-toe until you figured out all the possible moves and realized that there wasn't that much to the game to begin with. And then you move on. All the things you were hanging on to. And it's because there's something in there that we really like. That's where we hang on to what is to actually what is suffering. Maybe an idea we have about ourselves, an idea we have about how the world should be, how other people should be. And the idea may be right, but you're holding on to it is making you suffer. So that's a sign there's something wrong in there. So as John Lee says, you even have to get to the point where you stop hanging on to your rightness. That doesn't mean you stop trying to do what's right, but there are certain ways of being right that actually cause suffering, so you've got to watch out for that. You want to see what the craving is. What are you trying to get out of the things that you're holding on to? What are you thirsting for? What do you think they'll provide you with? It's often seeing that they won't provide you with that. That's that's when you begin to let go of them. And to see that clearly, you've got to get the mind concentrated. So it can see the subtle movements inside, and at the same time not have such an overriding sense of hunger all the time. You feed off of virtue. You feed off of concentration. You feed off of all the factors of the path. Concentration in particular, that's where you can get a sense of inner nourishment. But it also steadies the mind. So when the mind moves in one direction or another, you know. And you begin to see that what you used to think was simply watching things arising and passing away on their own was not the case at all. You were very much involved. The more sensitive you get to the way you shape things, the better you can get at it. You can create really refined states of well-being this way. And then you can use the skills that you develop in concentration to deal with other issues as they come. Because after all, the fabrications that you use to create that state of concentration. They're the same fabrications with which you can create greed or anger or fear or anxiety, jealousy, whatever unskillful states there are. It's basically the same processes. The whole purpose of this is to get reflective. And that's what right view is. That's what appropriate attention is. You watch yourself in action. You turn around and look at what you're doing. When I was in school studying history, one of the most fascinating things was to get writers writing about writing, thinkers thinking about thinking. Often it's much more interesting than the normal things they thought about or wrote about. Because it was closest to home, and those are the things they could really observe directly. As a meditator, you want to get fascinated in how your mind works, how it creates things, how it shapes things. You do this by trying to do it skillfully, and then you observe. What makes one state more skillful than another? What makes one mental skill more appropriate than another? These are things you can see in action, because the questioning, the thinking that's involved in appropriate attention is meant to be aimed right at what you're doing right now. It's not meant to get discursive and thinking back to last year or the last decade or your childhood or whatever. It's noticing what you're doing right now and asking questions about it. Is this the way? 
I should be doing it. And you think about the Buddha's instructions, and you also think about what your own experience is. Is this actually getting me the happiness I want? You think about the Buddha and his quest for awakening. The major turning points came when he stopped to reflect on what he was doing and the results he was getting, realizing, okay, things are not going the way I wanted them to. This, this practice is not getting the results I want. What else could I do? It was that self-reflective quality that made all the difference. This is why, as a meditator, you have to be constantly self-reflective. That's what appropriate attention is. It keeps focusing you back on your actions and the results you're getting. This is what the Four Noble Truths are all about. You're suffering. You can't blame it on the weather. You can't blame it on the economy. You can't blame it on the political structure. Those things may be miserable, but you don't have to be miserable because of them. It's what you're doing right now. Now, this is not blaming the victim. It's giving you the power to change the fact that you may be suffering right now. It reminds you that you don't have to. And the important element, i.e., the extent to which you're suffering over things, that is under your control. Or you can bring it under your control. So this is why this self-reflective ability is so important. It's what makes or breaks a meditator. You find there are things about yourself you don't like to look at, you say, look, I've got to look at these things. So you figure out how you strengthen your resolve. Strengthen your concentration so that you're stable enough to look at the things and not get blown away. And so it's by focusing your attention inside on the activities of the mind, having the mind watch its own activities. That was the Buddha's gift. That was his primary expression of compassion, so that you can look after yourself with ease.